Being, being the first one, I'm, I'm going to be, talk about the standard model, the standard model of physics, which is in fact, you heard about the, the, the birth of it from Professor Wallace. And I'll try to basically highlight the fact that the, the standard model, despite being very, very successful, is far from being the ultimate model, which is the ultimate description of nature which we can have. So, um, a brief introduction to ING physics. ING physics basically developed as, as one of the fundamental branches of science over the last centuries. And, you know, I, I think we all know about the atoms. And in fact, this shows the evolution in terms of trying to get to the fundamental building blocks of nature. And uh, it started from the atoms, and people soon real, realized that the atom was composed by a nucleus and uh, an electron orbiting around it. The nucleus as well turned out not to be elementary, and it <coughs> was composed by protons and neutrons, and in the 70s, uh, it was quite a surprise to some people that the, even the protons and neutrons were not elementary, but were composed by uh, pa uh, mo mo smaller particles, which are called quarks. So if you like, this is the picture which we have today on how, what are the fundamental building blocks for matter. Now, to add to this, one has to basically understand as well the way we represent interactions. It's like the cement which keeps the things together. <clears throat> the interactions, the forces, what we call normal in everyday life forces, are basically something which we represent as uh, through a mediator. When, when, I do, when I do this, basically I'm transferring energy from me to this electron, uh, and the vector is my, is my hand. The way we represent forces is similar, in the sense that whenever a force and interactions basically is, is a mediator which transfers energy and momentum from one particle to another, and this energy and momentum is carried by, again by particles, which are particles of a different nature, which are called basically the force particles. So that is the description we have <coughs> of uh, how things work at the fundamental level. Now, how do we do this? How do we explore this? And in fact, for the last 70 years, we basically, the fundamental tools for exploring how nature works have been accelerators. Accelerators basically accelerate particles. And the way we basically use them is by smashing particles onto other particles. In that process, basically, there are two things, two fantastic things which are happening. One is, you know, this E, F, M, C, e equal mc squared at play. I'm sure you've seen that, that, that fantastic equations, which basically states that energy and matter are equivalent. So to a certain extent, you can, ex you can convert energy into matter, and that is what we are doing, or matter into energy, which is what is happening, for example, in nuclear power plants or in the sun. And in doing so, we basically can <coughs> generate the whole state of matters which exist, even the ones which we are not familiar with in our, in our everyday life. No, that is one thing. So energy is the, is the key. The higher energy and the higher state of matter you can generate. You can generate particles with higher and higher masses. But then there is another aspect to accelerators, which is basically the fact that when you go at higher energy, you basically are able as well to explore the dynamics, or if you like, the forces of the interactions much, much better. Better means what? With, with much higher resolutions. In fact, the resolution in space or in time, now you can explore the way forces work, are in, inversely proportional to the energy which you're putting into the game. So, going to higher energy allows us to produce new state of matters of higher and higher masses and to explore the forces at smaller, or if you like, uh, smaller, uh, with much higher resolutions in space-time. Now, <coughs> talking about accelerators, the accelerators, which is state-of-the-art today, is basically the one which is sitting in Geneva, and uh, you know, if you were to land in Geneva, <coughs> this is the airport, this is the lake, now you would not see this, which is basically the outline of a tunnel, which is something like four meters in diameter, which is sitting roughly 100 meters below ground. The 100 meters have been chosen because this rock there, which is easy to excavate, so it's cheaper to do it at that depth than higher up. And they, you get for free shielding from radiation and everything else. In this, uh, along this ring, 
which houses the accelerator, there are four points where the particles which are being accelerated, which are protons, are brought into collision. In the accelerator, inside uh, <coughs> these structures, the protons are accelerated in one sense and in the other. And once they achieve the maximum energy, which is defined by the technology which is developed at CERN, which is basically the technology of the magnets, <coughs> once you achieve the maximum energy, they are brought into collisions into four points around the ring, where around these four points, we have basically set these huge uh, detectors, which are basically devices which surround the point where the collisions happen as best as we can, with, the, with sensors which are able to, if you like, see or make us see what happens when this uh, magic moment of the conversion of energy into matter happens. So when the, when the protons collide, these hundreds of fragments of new matter, which have nothing to do with the original protons, just flying out. And what we do, we basically track them, try, try to measure their trajectories, we measure them, we measure their nature, and we try to basically understand the best of what happened in that moment when the collision happened. And that is what <coughs> the scientists which belong to these four accelerators do. One thing to keep in mind, which not everybody realizes, is that CERN, which is the lab which is providing this tool, the accelerator, is in fact providing the accelerator. The science at CERN is done by people from all around the world. CERN has basically 13,000 users, which are basically scientists coming from all over the world. Uh, the last count, there were 101 different passports represented amongst the community at CERN. Uh, the, the UK community is an important one, uh, the Scottish web as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so here, uh, the, the, the lot of, I mean, these, these experiments have different purposes. The two general purposes, one are CMS and Atlas, which are basically meant to do, to exploit at maximum all of the uh, things which are coming out from the, from the physics produced in the, the collisions. And there are two other experiments, LHCB and ALICE, which are basically for more specific purposes. Now, uh, I don't have too much time, so let me cut a long story short. I mean, just to give you an example which that you all have heard, which is basically the discovery of the Higgs boson. And just to show what we achieve during our studies. Now, the Higgs boson is something which has been with us, I mean, we're told, uh, since 1964, when it was first hypothesized, but it was really from Weinberg paper that the thing became a consistent theory. The importance of the uh, broad hundred Higgs field, so called, <coughs> in, 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 the, in, the, in the development of the standard model is that this field, basically, which permeates phase space everywhere, is the one which accounts actually for the mass of the force particles, which, which I was discussing before, which are conveying the force, and also possibly account for the mass as well of every other matter particle around. So it's extremely important. Before that, there was no way of, of putting coherently something which is obvious, like the mass, into the equations of the standard model. But then, this field basically was hypothesized and it was explaining things. On the other end, it had only one thing which was uh, predicting, which, which was not found, which was an extra particle to be added to the zoo of particles which were existing. And that was the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson hunt started in 1970. And it kept every new accelerator which came online, basically <coughs> was looking for the Higgs boson. And uh, it was failing to find it, mostly because it didn't have enough energy. Again, E equals mc squared, enough energy to produce the mass of the Higgs boson. Until we got to the LHC, and the LHC, in the LHC we knew how the Higgs boson would look like if we, if we were able to produce it. And one of the things, for example, was this uh, Higgs, I mean, Higgs is a very ephemeral particle. It leaves at 10 to the minus 24 seconds, and then it decays, it disintegrates, into again particles which, on turn, might as well disintegrate. And this is one of the processes which we looked for, which is the Higgs disintegrating into two Z bosons, which turn disintegrate into four muons, which is the muons is the, is the heavy sister of the electrons. When you do that, what you see as a function of time, this was the first two years of data taking, you look at uh, this kind of events, where you can see these are the four muons, 
But there is, there is in nature things which produce four muons <coughs> naturally, even without the Higgs boson. And this is what, and we had foreseen those, and these are these blue shaded kind of distributions. And it was only when we well, saw... The dot is quite hard for us to see. Can we press the laser? So the point is that this was the, the background which was foreseen from standard sources. It was only when we saw you know, this red thing, this red peak growing, <laughs> and growing beyond the level, you know, these are, there is uh, all of this data, basically all of this, all of, all of this data is, is subject to, to statistic fluctuations. So it's only when we were convinced that what we were seeing was incompatible or having I mean, very small probability, less than a partner in minimum or being a fluctuation of what we were expecting, we decided that we might have a discovery. Now, the fact that we saw this in this channel, we saw it in another channel, and above all, that is the fundamental things of science, we were not the only one to see it. The experiment across the, across the, the, the ring was also seeing it. That basically convinced us that we, got, that we had <coughs> a discovery. Now, then the thing is history. This discovery led to the Nobel Prize in Physics of 2013 for Peter Higgs and Francois Angler. And basically we were all very, very proud to see that basically in the, in the uh, justification of the Nobel Prize, the role of the experiment classes in CMS was recognized because without the experimental evidence, that thing would not have happened. Now, after this, just to give you an idea, what is the standard model? The standard model, you know, what we do is nothing but discovering the mathematics which represents nature. And if you like, this is the mathematics <coughs> which represents our universe, sort of, so far. And uh, the X mechanism, if you like, is this thing, so non-trivial addition. <coughs> now we go into calculation. So, no, sorry. Uh, don't get scared. This is, the only, this is the only equation I'm going to show to you. So, uh, nature fundamental particles after July 4, 2012, this is what we have understood over the last 70 years of exploration with these accelerators. There are three families of fundamental particles. This is the one which basically built the world which we know, but in the evolution of the universe, for sure, there were as well these other uh, particles which were happening. One, the universe was much hotter and the energy which we were put in the game was similar to the one which you do at the LHC. There is the, the force particles, which are mediating the various interactions, electromagnetism, the weak force and the strong force which keeps together the nucleus, and now there is the explosion in the middle. So, uh, in fact, the standard model has become a new standard for success. This is just to give you an impression of how successful the standard model is. Now, we have a model which is a mathematical model which can make, make predictions about what happens whenever you, you look for specific phenomena. And the predictions are all of these bars, the solid bars. And the experimental measurements are the points with their errors. You can see that it's perfect match everywhere. And it is overproduction. I don't have the time to go into the details, but this is an incredible diversity in terms of production of particles, fundamental phenomena. And it is with production probability, which are spanning six orders of magnitude. So the standard model is extremely successful in predicting everything which is happening around us. So, what next, you might ask. Uh, <coughs> I'm using this picture because basically... Sounds like good time. Okay. <laughs> we have laid the keystone of the standard model cathedral. So this is the cathedral, we basically finished it. On the other hand, I've used, I've used the fuzzy picture on purpose. It's because basically, one of the things which we do as well is to measure all of these phenomena with increasing precision because we have tools, our experiments are, are so sophisticated that basically can allow us to measure things which we know much better than it was done in the past. So, we get a better picture. That is obviously one of the goals for the future, to get a better picture, to get better measurements. You might ask, is this all left to do? It's not the first time that this issue is posed. A guy from around here, uh, Lord Kerwin, uh, said that there's nothing new to be discovered in physics now, in 1900, <coughs> and all that remains is more and more precise measurements. Now, in this particular case, he was not right. <coughs> so, in fact, some of the unanswered questions, there is a lot of questions which we don't know the answer to. The other thing, the quantum field theory has been gravity. You might have noticed that of all of the forces I mentioned, there's no gravity. Now, gravity does exist. 
it is not dark. <laughs> and in the effect, of dif it is difficult to reconcile quantum mechanics, which, if you like, uh, <coughs> which is behind our standard model, and gravity has been a theoretical nightmare since 100 years. The dark matter is another cloud in the standard model sky. You probably have heard that from astronomical observation. We see that the matter in the universe, which we know is not only atomic, but is actually more than the atomic matter, which is dark matter, something which we don't know really what it is. And it cannot be, it is not explained in the standard model. The other thing is that we have only matter and not antimatter. When you look at the E equal MC squared, it is extremely democratical. Any time you convert energy into, into matter, it always generates as much matter as much antimatter. So somewhere along the line from the Big Bang to the beginning of the universe to today, something happened which basically reduced the amount of antimatter in the universe, and they basically created our own universe. And this is a something as well we don't have an answer to. The standard model itself inside, inside its mathematics has, has some tensions. In fact, there's difficulties to keep the Higgs boson mass as low as it has been measured. Now, so in other words, we have a beautiful cathedral with solid foundations, but then if you really look back, there's something else which you don't explain, which some, the model is incomplete, obviously. I hope you've all seen Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> so beyond the standard model, this thing has been realized by theorists a long time ago. This is to give you an idea of the number of theories which are trying to go beyond the standard model. It gives you as well, well some of them have already been disproved by ADC and the experiment. On the other hand, it gives you an idea of the confusion which is now into theory land. Okay? In fact, relations between theory and experiment has always been something very particular. Uh, this is how theory sees it. And in fact, I, being an experimentalist, I can actually say that this is a defendable picture. Uh, when you have very tight prediction, like the Higgs boson or rare Higgs decay rates and things like that. But today, with the confusion which is out there in theory land, the situation is rather like this. But basically, <laughs> the experiments are basically disproving one theory almost every week. And, uh, and I think that the ball is in the experimental field today. So, <laughs> summarizing, I think accelerator-based particle physics has achieved a major success and consolidated the standard model of nature never been as successful as today. Still, there are some fundamental questions which remain unanswered, and I hope that I've given you a hint that experimental measurements are now taking center stage, and it is basically the key to understand what, how to go forward. <coughs> it's clear that the answer to some of the most uh, pressing and unanswered questions is likely to be in the elementary particle domain, and uh, we are living through exciting times. You know, I told you that the, the key uh, to with discoveries or to understanding better nature is statistics. And this, uh, we are at a time where the LHC and the experiment are doubling the statistics every year. So that, that is uh, it's, uh, a very exciting time now. So possibly we'll have some answer in the next few years. So stay posted. Okay.